This video will introduce Darcy's law, and that's the equation we use fundamentally to describe flowing pores media. So let's write down Darcy's law and then explain the terms and have a little bit of discussion about it. So this is it. So if you followed the previous video on the, the Navier-Stokes equation, in the end, you had this basically viscous dissipation was linearly related to a, a, a force, basically the grad P, a pressure gradient, minus rho G, which is the acceleration due to gravity times the density. So it's basically, you know, flow downhill. That's really what it is. What is Darcy's law, though? Let's be very careful about the definition of the terms. So we'll start with the things that we know. There's the viscosity that was introduced in the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, well, that we, we think we understand. OK, that's the viscosity. P is the fluid pressure, the pressure in the fluid. And you have flow in response to a pressure gradient. OK, rho is the density of the fluid. OK, that's, that's fine. And G, I called it gravity. Let's, let's be a little bit more precise. This is the acceleration due to gravity, so 9.81 metres per second squared. And it is a vector because it has a direction, obviously, vertically downwards. What about Q? Q is sometimes called the Darcy velocity. And I'm putting it in inverted commas for good reason. Q can be defined in a porous medium. So you've got a porous medium, very complex, lots of pores. You can't really analyze in detail exactly what's happening in every pore. Now, maybe you can now with 3D X-ray imaging and you've got a very high performance computing and you solve actually the steady state Stokes equation, okay, and, and you get out the velocity field everywhere. But from an engineering perspective, that's not really what you need. You've got a porous medium, a piece of rock, or flow through a fibre or something, you just want to know what is the flow rate. So that's the average flow. So what Q is, it's really a Darcy flux. It's the volume of fluid flowing per unit area per unit time. Now, just be careful about that. What I mean is, imagine this pen is a porous medium. And what I've got is got a pump here, a high pressure, and then fluid is coming out at a lower pressure, atmospheric pressure. So there's a pressure gradient, a change in pressure divided by length. That's your pressure gradient. What is Q? Q is the volume of fluid that comes out per unit time, per unit area. Now, what do I mean by area? And this is where people get themselves into a terrible tangle for no good reason. In a porous medium, the area is the area, this. It's not just the area of the pores, and I go into a microscope and I end up all the little complex pore spaces and that's the area. No, 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 it's just the area, right? I've got a lump of rock, okay, that has an area. I don't need to know at this stage exactly what's poor and what's great. So it's the area of the whole porous medium. So it does have units of a velocity, Right, for volume per unit area, that's the units of length per unit time. So in SI, this has units meters per second. But it is not, and I emphasize not, the actual velocity with which a molecule of water moving through the tortuous pore space will be moving at. You can derive what that average velocity is, and that's in uh, later videos. But this is really a flux. It's an engineering type approach, right? I have a porous medium, I've got something underground. Stuff is pumped in, stuff is coming up. That's what I measure. Okay, I'm not fiddling around at what's in the detailed pore space. So this is an averaged equation. Now, this averaged equation can be derived from the Navier-Stokes equation. To a certain extent, intuitively, it makes sense. The flow rate must be inversely proportional. to Viscosity must be proportional to this driving force. So everything is possible there, but you have to have sort of complex integrals over the complex boundary conditions. 
And what you end up is with this coefficient k. So what Dolce's law does fundamentally is it introduces k. And k is the permeability. And k is the permeability is essentially the flow conductance. Large k means for a given force, you get a large flow. Small k means you get less flow. So it's a sort of hydraulic or flow conductance, right? It would be analogous in uh, electrical current to the conductance. Okay, so it's the permeability. Now let's discuss the units and then uh, say something about the history. So how do we how do we define the units? Well, it's it's easiest if we do it in again just strict SI. It's always it's always nicer to do this. The units of Q I've just said are meters per second. The units of viscosity are pascal seconds. Okay. The units of grad P are pascals for pressure divided by meters because it's a gradient. Rho G Actually, with a bit of fiddling around, it's got to have the same units. I'm not going to go through that. If that's a problem for you, just go um, and do it calmly yourself. But the reason why I do it this way is that when we look at the units here, okay, the Pascal here cancels out with the Pascal here. The second here, remember that's on the denominator, cancels out there. So the units of K, okay, are then, I put the meter up there, the units of K are meters squared. So it has the units of an area. Now what area is that? And you might say, oh yeah, 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 just a few moments ago you were emphasizing it's, it's the whole area of the pores radium. No, that can't be right, can it? Because say I've got a small piece of rock and a big piece of rock, the volume flowing per unit area per unit time should be the same if it's the same pore structure. So actually, the length or the area here is not the area of the system, but it's actually a typical area of a pore, or indeed, actually, more importantly, a throat, what limits the flow. So there's narrow restrictions. They're limiting the flow. K has units of square meters, and in physics, that isn't just, oh, oh that's interesting, <laughs> I don't know about the units, and mm, this SI thing is really irritating me. No. That means something physical. And that physical nature is is fact permeability is related to an area. And that area is the area of a pore. And we're going to develop that in the next video. But before we go any further, let's do a historical interlude. So I mentioned the uh, Navier-Stokes equation in the previous video, and I uh, made two mistakes. So the first, uh, for anyone who's Irish watching, watching this, George Stokes was in fact Irish. He was born in Ireland, but he did indeed work for 54 years at Cambridge and died at the age of 83 in Cambridge. But yes, it's, it would be wrong to de describe him uh, as anything other than, than an Irish uh, scientist. Um, the other was uh, Navier. Um, of course, he's not just Claude Navier. He's, he's Jean-Claude Navier. But the interesting thing is... Um, I've talked about Stokes now and where, where, where he was born and where he lived. Um, Jean-Claude Navier was uh, born in Dijon. And uh, that's exactly where Henry Darcy comes from as well. So Henry Darcy was a French civil engineer. He worked in Dijon. And he published in 1856 a book called Les Fontaines Publiques de la Ville de Dijon. And uh, if anyone French is watching this video, of course, you've no idea what I just said. So uh, I'll translate it, uh, Public Fountains of Dijon. So in those days, you didn't necessarily have clean tap water provided to your house, but you did have public fountains that you could use as a source of drinking water. And Henry Darcy designed basically all the pipes that collected fresh water from a natural spring and brought it into the centre of the city. But one problem here is how can you ensure that the water is clean? Well, what, is, what he used, and in fact what is still used today, are sand filters. Flow through a porous medium can filter out bacteria and viruses. Now, how is that possible? Well, bacteria, 
they're quite small. They, they're sort of at the micron or smaller scale, but they tend to clump. So bacteria can actually be literally filtered out by a porous medium, say by a sand pack, because it can't pass, the clumps of bacteria can't pass through the pore space. What about viruses? They can. But the point is both bacteria and viruses actually want to absorb, want to stick to the solid surface. And porous media have a lot of solid surface. So if you run water through a porous medium, and in, in Henry Darcy's case, a, um, a sand pack, as a filter, you will remove most of the bacteria and viruses. And it's the same reason why, for instance, if you're walking in the countryside in a field which has cows and sheep doing what cows and sheep do in the field, so all the puddles, you know, seem terribly polluted, but next door is a stream, and in the stream, hopefully, is completely clean and water that's possible to drink. It's because basically all the pollutants in the water are absorbed in the soil. So Henry Darcy designed these sand filters, and in an appendix of his famous book, he introduced Darcy's law, not obviously in the form we see, but empirically. He basically made these measurements of fluid flow and introduced this concept of permeability. Now, again, anyone French is still puzzling over what the title of the book was, and then they're saying, well, you made another mistake, Martin, because why is he called Henry? Surely he was Henri. Actually, um, he did style himself in an English way, because he had an English wife. Um, but yes, he, he was indeed, as I said, a um, famous engineer from Dijon, the same town as uh, Jean-Claude Navier. And the reason why I mention that is that he was almost certainly aware of the development of essentially the Navier-Stokes equation. And he knew that what he was seeing empirically in a porous medium was something consistent with that concept. Okay, as I said, we're now going to continue with this concept of permeability and particularly this relationship to area. But before I go any further, I just want to say one other thing that does sometimes confuse people. I've written this correctly, um, but there are these two minus signs. So I just want to make that a little bit clear. Flow goes from high, so if I've got pressure here, and this is distance, flow goes from high to low pressure, right? If you have a high pressure and a low pressure, that's the flow direction, okay? The pressure gradient, you know, think about your calculus, what's dp dx? The pressure gradient is negative. So to have a positive flow in the x direction, okay, requires a minus grad p. And you see this in lots of other equations as well. It's a minus gradient. So don't get, oh, why is it a minus and what's going on, okay? Because flows um, goes from high to low pressure. On the other hand, flow is also downhill, and if we define the flow direction as pointing downhill, then those two minor signs have to cancel out, so you have a positive flow in the direction of gravity. Otherwise, you'd have flow going uphill, which doesn't make any sense. So you have flow due to gravity, flow due to a pressure gradient, and that's why there's that minus sign there. Sometimes that sort of half disappears where I replace a gradient by a difference, but I'll try and make clarify that later. Okay, thank you very much.